Good evening and welcome. Uh, this evening is our final evening in the series of our CIR Confession Series. Um, I'd like to take a moment to sincerely thank the um, PIA Law, our platinum sponsors, and sponsors of this informative series. Without their support, this would not be able to do the work that we do. Tonight, representing PIA Law, I would like to welcome Mr. Brandon Peterson. When he was a young boy, a Two of Brandon's family members were killed in a motor vehicle crash caused by a negligent driver. This motivated Brandon to pursue a career as personal injury lawyer so that he could advocate on behalf of others affected by negligence. Brandon received an honors Bachelor of Arts degree from Western University in majoring in political science, and he earned his law degree from Western University. Brandon started with the firm in 2019 as a summer student and returned to for his articles in 2020. Soon after being called to the bar in June 2021, he joined McClatch Orlando as an associate. Please welcome Mr. Brandon Peterson. Thank you for those kind words, Melissa. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm here to introduce Dr. Gargoom for, for today's webinar. Dr. Sean Gargoom is a board certified chiropractor having graduated from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College with cum laude distinction and clinic honors. Previous to chiropractic school, Dr. Gargoom attended the University of Western Ontario, earning a ba honors Bachelor of Arts in Kinesiology while maintaining a Dean's List status. Dr. Gargoom is a diver diversified practitioner providing treatment consisting of myofascial release, chiropractic adjustments, exercise prescription, nutritional counseling, and neurofunctional acupuncture. Dr. Gargoom has taken additional certification in the management of concussion and is currently completing his Master's of Rehabilitation Science at the University of McMaster. Welcome, Dr. Gargoom. Thank you very much, Brandon, and welcome everybody joining us tonight uh, for the fourth and the final uh, webinar in the concussion series. So you may have seen me at the first one, which was the Concussion 101, and then colleagues of mine, Ayushi and Colleen, um, occupational therapist and social worker, did the previous two weeks. And today is the final one, and you get me again. And today we're going to be talking about nutrition and physical activity and how they relate to concussion. So... Uh, we are going to start with nutrition. I'm just going to share my screen. A um, couple things just to preface this. I normally like to walk and uh, walk around and use my hands when I talk. So if you see me fidgeting in the screen, I apologize. A um, couple of things that I've said previous or that I said at the first uh, webinar, I should say as well. This is a space for education. It's not a space for assessment and diagnosis. So while I... Uh, can appreciate that you may have some questions specific to your condition or your case or a loved one or friend's case. Um, we're going to try to avoid the specifics. Uh, I can give kind of generalized answers, but um, it's always best to consult with a healthcare practitioner in person for an adequate uh, assessment and follow up information at that point if you have specific questions. All right, so let's get into it. We're gonna talk about nutrition and concussion first. So I would like to preface this first by saying uh, that I am a chiropractor. And so while I do have training um, through my chiropractic and kinesiology degrees in nutrition and some additional training in nutrition um, from some other courses I've taken, this is not my area of specialty. It is under my scope of practice to be able to recommend some things, but it's always best to see a nutritionist, a dietitian, naturopath, somebody who's who's uh, much well versed and much smarter than I am in this area. But I can give you some information and I can answer any questions you have to the best of my abilities. Uh, I'd like to start off first by talking about medication. Uh, and so medication is often a hot topic when it comes to a lot of different conditions, but especially so in concussion because um, medications are often the first line of defense that physicians will um, use to manage or to treat concussion patients. And I would like to say that they definitely have a time and a place. Medications are designed for a purpose. And if prescribed by your physician, you should be following 
as they are recommended to you. Um, that being said, I don't think they should be utilized uh, for concussion specific, I should say, uh, in long-term fashion. And uh, I think they should be an adjunct to treatment. They should not be the sole, uh, sole treatment that is being used by uh, any sort of concussion patient. Uh, medications typically are designed to treat the signs and the symptoms of a concussion, uh, not the actual root cause. And if you go back to our first webinar where I spoke about the origins of concussion, how concussions are caused and, and some of the theories behind post-concussive syndrome, you'll see that many of them are not designed or many of them are not treatable through medication use. It's just the secondary or tertiary effects of a concussion that are treated by the medication. Side effects. Uh, many medications have side effects. We've all seen the commercials uh, on TV where you know they rapidly run through the thousand side effects that you may experience with a medication. So that's always something to consider as well is that taking a medication will typically or may cause uh, some unwanted side effects as well. Dependency, so medications work, right? And, and so that's a good thing. We like that they work, but sometimes we, we enjoy that a little bit too much, I'll say, and we can become dependent on uh, medications. Some obviously, you know, with the whole opiate crisis going on, um, may have unwanted dependency issues or, or let's say more sinister dependency issues. So it's very important to consider that. And then the cost, um, without a drug plan uh, or extended health benefits, many people must incur the cost of medications. And so while some of them you know, are cheaper than others, it's still a cost and, and we have to think of it that way as well. I wanna give you an example um, from, this is, you know, I can tell you about a specific patient, but this is from a number of different patients that I see. Um, and some people listening to this may have been prescribed this medication, but gabapentin is a medication. It's actually, it's an anticonvulsant, but it's, it's used um, to, or it's a commonly prescribed for nerve pain. And so many times when a patient goes to see their family physician or potentially a specialist, um, and they are there for a concussion injury, Physicians think concussion, brain, nerves. So let's prescribe this gabapentin because uh, this will help to reduce the nerve pain. But if we look at some of the side effects there, so dizziness, drowsiness, loss of coordination, blurred or double vision, kind of sounds like a lot of the symptoms that you would have with a concussion injury or post-concussive syndrome. So we get into this issue where we're taking this medication and we may start to experience or it may exacerbate some of these other symptoms that we have had. And then, you know, we start questioning where are these symptoms actually coming from? Are they coming from the medication? Are they coming from the concussion? Is there some other explanation that we haven't yet um, been able to elicit? So it clouds, it very much so clouds the, the whole picture. And occasionally what we see is something called the pharmaceutical cascade which is essentially masking side effects of a medication with another medication. And so in this example, gabapentin, maybe um, there's the patient is experiencing dizziness as a side effect. And so the physician will prescribe another medication in order to combat this dizziness. And who knows, maybe that medication has tertiary side effects and so on and so on and so on. And so it ends up being that I've seen this countless of times in practice where uh, a patient comes in, I ask them, if they're on medications and ask them how long, and they say, I've been on this for 15 years. And I say, for what? And they don't know. They have no idea what a medication is being used for. And that's scary, right? Because while they are beneficial in most cases, they work and they have an effect. And so if you don't know what you're on it for, I mean, that's not the most ideal outcome, right? Uh, so there's always with any, any, any sort of treatment, there always has to be a cost benefit analysis done. And this has to show us that the cost uh, is outweighed by the benefit of these medications being used. And so we'll look at alternative interventions. Um, so potential for other avenues of intervention with minimal risk. And so something like nutrition falls under this. Um, nutrition can it, nutrition is a little bit of an umbrella word. It can encapsulate things like um, 
alterations to one's diet. It can encapsulate things like supplementation, um, any sort of uh, exogenous or endogenous, meaning from the body or from without the body supplementation. And typically, the risk is very low uh, with using any sort of these interventions because it can be a variety of things such as food or such as naturally occurring supplements that we are just fortifying. So nutrition is essentially the foundation of health. Uh, food and minerals and vitamins are essentially the building blocks for many of the cellular processes that we, uh, our body does every single day, every single minute, every single second. And so if we can uh, ensure that we're putting quality into our body, we'll get quality output as well. Uh, I love this quote by Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And so I think that very perfectly encapsulates that. And so just like I said, supplementation is providing uh, additional exogenous resources for the body to use. So taking something that is from without the body, putting it into the body in order to provide more of those building blocks. So there is minimal research. There is more research now. Uh, and coming, but there is minimal research about nutrition, supplementation specific to concussion or mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. Um, there is, however, substantial research on other neurocognitive decisions, or sorry, neurocognitive conditions, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, um, some of the longer, longer standing, I'll say, uh, quote unquote, neuro, uh, degenerative, neurodegenerative conditions. Um, just so not that concussion hasn't been around for a long time. It's just that we've become better at recognizing it, better at assessing it. So with that being said, just more time to be able to research uh, nutritional intervention on those other conditions. So again, if we do our, oh, sorry. And the reason why that's important is that um, we have ample research that we can make inferences from. So while it may not be specific to concussion or MTBI, we can infer some of the findings from those from those uh, research papers and actually apply them to our situation with concussion. Cost benefit analysis has to be done like always. And so the side effects in nutrition and supplementation typically very low, unless there are things like allergens or sensitivities. Uh, there's mostly high potential for positive outcomes and then minimal negative outcomes. So that's a positive for our cost benefit analysis. And there's other potential positive effects as well. So um, nutrition will not just be targeted specifically to the concussion, but it can also help with things like bone density. It can help with um, cardiovascular health. It can help with cognitive health. There's a whole number of different benefits that can be gleaned from nutritional intervention. So I'm not gonna tell you anything groundbreaking here. I'm just gonna try and put it into a nice little package for you. And so what I like to start off with is just some of the basic principles here. And so, the basic principles of nutrition are uh, things that you can apply. It's not going to be follow a specific diet, take certain supplements, um, but it's just generally what we want to look at doing for our, our diet and our nutritional health. So number one is overall limit inflammation. So if we think back to the first webinar, one of the theories of post-concussion syndrome was that it's a persistent inflammatory response. So injury to the microglia, which are cells that support the brain and provide brain function, causes a release of inflammatory cytokines or excitotoxins, which are basically just inflammatory neurochemicals. This increases oxidative stress, which causes more inflammation, which causes injury to microglia, which causes a release of inflammatory cytokines. And you can see it's this kind of circular argument here. So how do we combat that? We limit inflammation uh, with whatever we put into our bodies. Two is to correct any sort of deficiencies. So minerals, vitamins, they are functional resources, meaning that we use those to help. They're the building blocks, like I said before, to help uh, create, to break down, to uh, actually cause reactions to happen in our body, to improve the processes in our body. So those are the foundational things that we need to have. So. We want to correct any sort of deficiencies that we have. Antioxidants are um, just as they have in their name. So they're protection against an ROS or reactive oxidative species, which are things that cause oxidative stress. So antioxidants, things like cranberries, lots of different berries, blueberries um, are high in antioxidants. And so they help 
protect, protect against that oxidative stress. And omega-3s, things like uh, EPA, DHA, commonly found in fish oils, they have a whole host of different benefits. One of those primarily in this case would be neuroprotective mechanisms. And so um, they help to uh, protect any sort of nerves or neural structures. They help to uh, also um, heal and regenerate and improve function of those neural structures as well. Number three is limit food allergens. So it's important to know the allergen, what an allergen is versus a sensitivity. So an allergen is, you know, you go and get your allergy tested and they poke your arm with a whole bunch of different things. And it shows up that, oh, you are allergic to eggs or you are allergic to wheat. Um, and those are outright allergens and that will show up on those tests. However, there is also a sensitivity, which is maybe you are sub threshold. You're not actually showing enough of a response to be allergic to something, but your body maybe just doesn't get along with it too well. And it's a little bit sensitive. Um, and so that can also um, cause inflammation in the body, right? Even if you're not outright allergic, just a mild sensitivity, mild to moderate sensitivity can also cause um, inflammatory response to take place. And this promotes inflammation in the gut. And we'll talk about the gut in just a minute. Number four is to limit simple sugars and refined carbohydrates. Things like white breads, white sugars, white rices. Um, we want to instead replace them with complex sugars or brown, um, brown breads, brown rices, more complex um, sugars. The reason being is that simple sugars serve to suppress the immune system. There's documented research in that can impair white blood cells for up to five hours, which affects our immune response. And it also increases our free radicals or those reactive oxidative species and decreases antioxidants. So even if you are doing your best and eating all the cranberries you can, and you still go and you eat your donuts, you eat your fried foods, things like that, your white breads, then it can also, um, it, they, it can render it null essentially. And number five is promote gut and intestinal health. So gut meaning stomach, intestines, um, some of the other uh, organs in the, in the body that, are, that go along with gut health, things like the gallbladder, uh, liver. So the enteric nervous system is the nervous system, part of the nervous system that actually supplies your, those gut and uh, gut organs. And it's been deemed the second brain. And the reason being is that it's so complex down there that it actually, not that it, it resembles a, a brain exactly, but there are very many similarities um, between the enteric nervous system and our central nervous system. Um, and so because of that, I mean, it's become such a hot topic now that we, we want to do everything we can to improve to promote gut and intestinal health, things like taking probiotics or other digestive aids. Um, and that can help to decrease systemic inflammation as well. I mean, we're seeing things like yogurts that you can buy off the shelf now with probiotics in them and being advertised as having probiotics in them. And so uh, this is to help with gut health here. Now, these are principles. They don't have to be followed 100% of the time or to a T. Like for example, number four with simple sugars, no white breads. That's very difficult to do 100% of the time. But that doesn't mean that you know doing it 80% of the time wouldn't be beneficial. Doing it 70% of the time wouldn't be beneficial. It's just that these are principles or guidelines to apply to your overall nutritional health. So brain injury recovery diet. We're going to talk about a study that was done here because uh, this was pretty interesting. So. There were no diets that had been studied specific to concussion or MTBI in humans yet. Okay. Um, that research is coming, but nothing uh, substantial as of yet, at least that I've seen. Um, but we're going to talk about a specific diet called the MIND diet. It's not exactly uh, designed around concussion, but it, there are some similarities. So we'll speak about that in a second. The one thing that we always have to do when we're looking at any intervention really, but specifically for nutrition here is that we have to always consider the starting point of the patient, the metabolic state of the patient. If we are dealing with somebody who is in pristine health prior to injury, um, takes care of their body from a nutritional point of view, is very physically active, um, then we can reasonably estimate that that person would respond better to treatment, better to nutritional intervention than to somebody who is sedentary or somebody who um, does not take care of their nutritional health or um, does not follow those basic principles that we had just gone over, OK? 
Okay. Um, maybe they have some comorbidities or other uh, preventable lifestyle diseases. So that will play a role. And we have to take an overall picture, an overall look at the patient, because um, if we don't, then we will not realize full resolution. But let's talk about the MIND diet. So MIND stands for Mediterranean Intervention for Neurocognitive Delay. And so this was a very large scale study that was done for Alzheimer's patients. And so I know Alzheimer's um, is not the same as concussion or MTBI, but there are some similar presentations, both in pathophysiology or how it happens and in symptoms. Okay? Now I'm not saying that Concussion patients are just like Alzheimer's state patients, but there are some similar presentations. And that's why the MIND diet um, study was done. They, and that's why they chose uh, Alzheimer's as a comparable uh, population. The MIND diet combines the Mediterranean diet, which is a very popular diet over the past, let's say 20, 30 years, and the DASH, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So a diet designed to reduce blood pressure. So we're going to talk about some things that the MIND diet encourages and some things that the MIND diet um, advises against. Okay, so again, nothing groundbreaking here, just some, some good, solid nutritional foundational advice. So the MIND diet encourages consumption of the following, green leafy vegetables, uh, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, salad. It'll give you servings as well. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but green leafy vegetables, um, high in iron, high in magnesium, high in a number of other uh, supplements or, or foundational nutrients um, that can help to encourage overall health. All other, all other vegetables, non-starch based, so removing things like potatoes or, or parsnips, um, one serving per day. Berries, so strawberry, blueberry, blackberry, raspberries, I will add cranberries as well. Those are high in your antioxidants. Nuts, so a variety of types. Brazil nuts are one of the more popular brain foods, we'll call, um, and so it encourages the, the consumption of those. And olive oil, using them for using olive oil for cooking and for dressings. And so, you know, again, if you if you know anything about the Mediterranean diet, um, design around the diet that is often used for countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea, they often will use a fairly high degree of olive oil. Um, for many of their uh, cooking interventions. It also, the MIND diet also encourages whole grains. So like I said, limits the simple carbohydrates and encourages complex carbohydrates. So whole wheat foods. It encourages fish, fatty fish, because of that omega-3 um, omega content. So uh, salmon, sardines, trout, tuna, mackerel. Encourages the consumption of beans the consumption of poultry, which is obviously a white um, or a lighter type of uh, um, meat. And everybody's favorite encourages the consumption of wine, red over white, because it has a certain nutri nutrient in it called resveratrol. Uh, and fortunately, unfortunately, I'll, make you, I'll let you uh, make that decision. A max of one glass per day with the wine. Okay, so like I said, nothing, nothing uh, too complex. Um, it's all the stuff I think that most people would typically think of as being quote unquote good for you, right? It's, it's not that we're asking you to eat the most outlandish thing that you can only find on the top of the Himalayas. It's just that these are all very accessible foods. And again, they're quote unquote, what we would normally think of as good foods. And so let's talk about what the mind diet uh, encourages to avoid. Butter and margarine. And so butter, I, I have a bit of a tough time with this because there's actually some good research now where high quality grass fed butter is actually a, a, a positive to use. But again, I'm just I'm telling you what the diet says. So encourage, encourages the avoidance of butter and margarine. Cheese, which is the one I have the biggest difficulty with because I love cheese. Um, yeah, so it tells you to, to you know, avoid a more than one ounce per week. Red meats, so beef, pork, lamb, so no more than three servings per week. Fried foods is hot. The, this is the one where it actually says they're highly discouraged. Um, and I think we can understand why not only the, the oil and fat content, but also the simple carbohydrates. 
um, which again encourages the systemic inflammation. Pastries and sweets, uh, again, encourages um, systemic inflammation. So again, things that maybe we are not, that we would typically think of as quote unquote being less good for us or bad for us. Um, and we would tend to avoid a lot of these things. I will say one thing, it doesn't say, other than fried foods being highly discouraged, uh, it doesn't say to completely avoid or completely eliminate, okay? So it gives you things to not exceed. Um, and so I like that for this because it makes it, it's more realistic, I think. I do not like restrictive diets because I think that they're only realistic for very short periods of times. And I don't think that we want to get into the business of, you know, getting on, getting off, getting on, getting off diets. I think we should try to live and eat in such a way that we're able to maintain generally a, uh, a positive nutritional intake most of the time with the thoughts that, yes, we will have occasional days where we are less good than others as far as what we put into our body. But that's okay because we have to live, we have to enjoy it. So generally, the MIND diet encourages um, foods that are high in antioxidants, take longer to digest, which again are those complex carbohydrates, are high in omega-3s, which are like our fishes, have a high nutrient calorie ratio. So we're getting our best bang for our buck uh, as far as the most nutrients for the, the least amount of calories. That's not to say that we should restrict calories, but just that our, our ratio is dense. And wine that uh, resveratrol, and especially in the red wine, has anti-cognitive delay effects. So um, positive for our, our mind and our brain health. Foods that are discouraged are high in trans or saturated fats. They promote inflammation and they have short digestion times. Benefits of the MIND diet were found to be a memory enhancing effect. That's great, obviously, um, because memory is often an issue that um, concussion and PCS patients uh, have, uh, have difficulty with. Decreases systemic inflammation. Improves insulin sensitivity. We all know insulin from, from diabetics and storage, or sorry, uh, sugar storage. However, insulin also has a neuroprotective effect, so it can help to uh, protect some of our neural structures. Uh, and the mind diet was also found to increase neurotrophic factors or factors that help to build or regenerate some of our neural tissues. So BDNF is the big one. And I want you to remember these two BDNF and IGF one, because we're going to talk about them in physical activity as well. But BDNF is brain derived neurotrophic factor. IGF one is insulin like growth factor. And these both promote nerve health, sorry, promote nerve growth and repair. So very positive factors for a concussion recovery. Uh, and then to a lesser extent, the mind diet promotes ketosis. We may have heard of ketosis through some of the diets, uh, the big diets out there, like the Atkins diet or the paleo diet. Uh, I'm not interested in the, the weight loss effects there. However, ketosis does help to improve mitochondrial function. Mitochondria are parts of the cell that actually produce our energy or ATP. Uh, and that can be effective for uh, healing. This is what I love is that following the mind diet just to a degree also had shown benefits. So it doesn't have to be that you follow it 100% all the time, like I had said, even if you follow it 50% of the time, 60% of the time, 90% of the time, that is much better than not utilizing any of the principles at, at all. And it still has benefits. So even if you just incorporate one or two things from what I'm showing you here, you're gonna have positive benefits. I'm gonna quickly go through some supplementation I think you will have access either to this webinar or to my notes afterwards if you would like to look uh, a little bit more in depth into these. Um, there are typically, I'm going to go through just a few of the supplements here. I think there's maybe seven or eight of them listed. There's typically three that we recommend to uh, our concussion or PCS patients. And those are omegas, uh, omega-3s, um, magnesium, and vitamin D. Uh, there is a fourth occasionally that we will, and that's turmeric. Um, and we'll talk about these four quickly here. So fish oils or omega-3s, um, the omega-3s are DHA and EPA or docosahexonic acid and nicosapentoic acid. These are, like I said, they have a whole host of benefits from cognitive to joints and muscular to uh, neural to 
visual, there's, there's just a ton of benefits to have to taking omega threes. Fish oils are one of the highest uh, densities of omega threes. And so that's why you'll often see them in a fish oil. You don't have to take the actual oil. There are capsules out there now. And so you can't taste any of the fish. Um, but and we can see all the, the benefits here. So anti-inflammatory effect promotes brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is the one we spoke, we just spoke about reduces cog, or, sorry, improves cognition, reduces neural edema or swelling, promotes dendrite growth, which is dendrites are part of nerve tissue. And so, um, you can see there are a ton of benefits there. So it's always a good idea to supplement with fish oil or omega threes. I'm gonna skip over creatine. You can read it afterwards if you'd like. Curcumin and turmeric. So turmeric is one, like I said, that we will occasionally uh, recommend. Very popular in um, East Indian cooking, especially. Turmeric is a natural plant product um, and it has the bright kind of yellowish color and it's a very natural anti-inflammatory. Um, and so it decreases uh, C-reactive proteins, improves beta amyloid clearance. So those are a little bit, more of the sciencey uh, reasons behind it, but basically it's an anti-inflammatory. And I have a number of, of patients of uh, East Indian descent who will actually warm a glass of milk, put a spoonful of turmeric in the milk, and they will drink that. Uh, I can't promise that it tastes that great, but um, they anytime that I, I have a patient um, uh, come in, uh, I, will, I will offer that as a solution. There are also kind of more trendy things out there now, like turmeric lattes. Uh, I'm not too sure on what the content of turmeric is in there, but you can actually get it as a, a capsule as well. So you don't have to just load your food up with turmeric if you don't like the taste of it. Magnesium, it's an essential mineral. Essential mineral, this is one we always recommend. Plays a vital role in nerve transduction, mitochondrial efficiency, or um, ATP production, energy production. And it also plays a role in muscular tone and tension. So that's one we always recommend. Uh, vitamin D and E, so D more so we, we recommend. So they have positive effects on cognition and strong antioxidant effects, which help to protect, protect against that ROS or reactive oxidative species. Um, and so there is an anti-inflammatory aspect to that as well. Melatonin is the big one. Other people, people may have heard of as well. Melatonin helps to uh, helps with sleep as well. And then there's a couple of other ones there that you can, uh, you can review, but, uh, like I said, I'm not going to uh, go over those right now because we have a lot to get through still. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop here. I know this is questions. We'll stop and we'll get to questions at the end. So I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm just thinking maybe we want to take a few minute break here. Uh, just because I know we, we may need a screen break. So let's do that. It's 6.33 now. Um, let's, sorry, 6.34. Let's start back up in four minutes. So 6.38. Okay, great. So just finished up the nutritional one. And let's talk about physical activity now. Sorry. Okay, physical activity and concussion. So again, nothing groundbreaking here. I'm gonna just highlight some of the benefits. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some specific, a specific testing protocol that is often used. Um, and then just some recommendations at the end. So let's talk about physical activity or exercise, okay. Um, there, I love phys, I love the idea of physical activity. I love physical activity doing it, but I love the idea of physical activity because um, there are countless interventions that many people have tried. It can be things like laser. It can be things like acupuncture. It can be things like chiropractic manipulation. It can be, you know, this medication, that medication. It can be whatever. There's so many things out there. Hypnosis, whatever. But the thing that has the best backing by the literature, by the research is physical activity. And I love that because physical activity can be free. It can be easy. It can be hard. It can be so adaptable. It's just, it's such a simple thing. People don't often like to do it because it's work. 
right? And that's just a very honest assessment is that people like to have passive therapies done because they don't have to put in the work. And will those passive therapies work for that person? They may, right? The research sometimes will say, yeah, sometimes says no, sometimes maybe 60% of, 60 of the time it'll work. But physical activity is, has been shown to be the strongest and most effective intervention, but it's work. And, and hopefully if you're not doing any physical activity now, I can convince you of all the benefits here and that'll make you wanna do it. So general physical activity benefits, neurochemical releases. You may have heard of endorphins. There's another subset called enkephalins. These are neurochemicals that become released by the body when we do physical activity. There are feel good neurochemicals. You know, if you've ever, if you're a runner or you, you know a runner, you've heard of runners um, and they talk about the runner's high, that's typically because they get a release of these neurochemicals and they're feel good. They make you happy. They make you, they make the body feel good. They help to, um, they have again, kind of uh, anti-inflammatory benefits as well. So that is one of the biggest benefits to physical activity, physical well-being. So physical activity can help to affect body composition, right? Changing uh, fat tissue, uh, the ratio of fat tissue to muscle tissue in our favor. It can help with cardiac health or heart health and systemic cardiac health. It can help with uh, bone health, increasing bone density. It can help with lifestyle diseases or, uh, prevention, things like diabetes, right? What's one or what should be one of the most recommended interventions for, for pre-diabetics or new diabetics is exercise. It can help with fatigue or energy levels, a uh, whole host of physical benefits there. And it can also help with psychological or emotional well-being. Okay, I, I typically tell this uh, or use this as an example. My wife uh, has been diagnosed with anxiety, and so her big outlet is running. She's she's a running nut, and she she typically will run between an hour and an hour and a half each day. And so we just carve out time for that. That I watch her kids, and she's able to go and do her run because without that, she. She has a tough time from, uh, from a stress and anxiety perspective. So it can be a very useful tool in that realm. It can also help with hormonal or neurochemical regulation, right? Again, the release of certain neurochemicals, it can help to balance hormones as well. And it can inspire people. It can increase people's confidence. It can be fun, right? Doing activity with a, with a friend or a loved one can be awesome. It can help to improve relaxation and sleep. You know, um, typically, if you, you are more active, you will have a higher quality of sleep. And then just generally, quality of life measures through lots of different research have been shown um, to be uh, higher with people who are physically active. So tons of, of benefits there. And I'm going to highlight a few of the cons. I might be a little bit jaded here, but um, some of the cons. So sure, potential for injury. You may hurt yourself by doing whatever activity you're doing, but you could also hurt yourself by stepping off a uh, sidewalk onto the street as well. So um, there's a potential for that. Time consumption, that's the big barrier that everybody likes to talk about is it takes too much time. It doesn't have to though, right? So lots of different methods. People will go for a 15 or 20 minute walk, right? And that could be enough for, for you specifically or breaking it up into you know 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Maybe I do 10 in the morning, 10 at my lunch and 10 in the afternoon. Um, or we, you know, for those that are a little bit more physically active, we can do HIIT workouts or high intensity interval training where, you know, maybe we're only working out for 12 to 15 minutes, but it's very, uh, high level. And so it doesn't have to be these, you know, one and a half hour runs. Like I described earlier, we can, we can tailor it so that it's not too time consuming and removes that barrier cost potential. Sure. If you, if you want to join some of the fancy gyms for, you know, the, the F45s or the lifetime fitness for 200 bucks a month, um, or you want to buy all the fancy, um, equipment, but like I just said, go for a run outside, go for a walk outside, right. Um, go for a bike ride. Uh, you know, they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be this crazy expensive, uh, intervention. It can be just like anything you can spend money on it, but it doesn't have to be that way. Okay, we're gonna talk about physical activity and how it should be utilized, how I utilize, how our company and, and my colleagues utilize it in the management of concussion patients. So there are certain assessment protocols that we utilize, um, obviously when assessing patients at the, at the outset or any sort of reassessments. 
there are certain treatment protocols and that we use physical activity throughout the duration of treatment. And then there's return to work, return to learn, return to play, return to play protocols that we use as well. And things like clearance tests to ensure that it, uh, an athlete is ready to get back on the ice if they're playing hockey or um, other measures to make sure that the person returning to their activities of daily living are prepared for that. So uh, again, thinking back to first week and Concussion 101 webinar, I spoke about CISG, which is a concussion and sport group, uh, consensus of all the experts in the world come together and basically they, they present their research to one another and then they come to these uh, collaborative guidelines. Uh, last one was in 2017. There should be one coming out shortly as well. So from that document, this is there are two statements here I wanted to go over. So at a minimum, the assessment should include a comprehensive history or a detailed conversation, focused physical examination, which would include things like neurological testing, um, testing of the cervical spine, coordination testing, a lot of the things that we spoke about at the, the first lecture, and special tests where indicated an example of graded aerobic exercise test. So they are advocating for the use of aerobic exercise testing at the assessment. Secondary point here is there is preliminary evidence supporting the use of an individualized symptom limited aerobic exercise program. So individualized meaning it should be tailored to the person symptom limited in the fact that we don't want to do exercise that is going to completely blow the person away as far as symptom exacerbation and aerobic exercise, meaning cardiovascular type exercise or exercise that stresses the, the lungs and the heart essentially. Um, so an exercise program in patients with persistent post-concussive symptoms associated with autonomic instability or physical deconditioning. Okay. So advising that in most post-concussive symptoms, the use of this tailored exercise program is advised as well as a targeted physical therapy program in patients. So targeted physical therapy program, meaning, um, physical rehabilitation. So exercises and movements in that thing, that type of thing. Um, in patients with cervical spine or neck or vestibular dysfunction or balance system. Okay, so this basically is telling us that we should be using cardiovascular training, we should be using physical rehabilitation for the neck, and we should also be using physical rehabilitation for our balance system or our vestibular system. Okay. Which is great. This is this is the protocol that our company uses, the protocol that many of our, our colleagues that do very good work use. Um, where my frustration lies is when I see patients that have gone to facilities and again, it's been this passive type treatment, right? Come in, I'll rub your neck for 15 minutes and then I'll strap you up to a uh, electric machine and you'll get a TENS or a stimulation and that'll be it. Will you feel better? You may for a short duration, but I don't think you will actually experience resolution, right? I'm not going to say that's for everybody or 100% of the patients, but for most patients. Okay? This is what the experts in the world, the foremost experts in the world are advising. And so this is what we choose to do. Okay, in the assessment phase, um, the assessment of acute patients, acute concussion patients versus chronic concussion patients or post-concussion syndrome patients uh, is different. And, and so our utilization of um, physical activity testing is also different in those two populations of patients. First and foremost, the assessment should, in either case, should rule out any more sinister pathologies. Okay? And this is where we do our neuro neurological testing. That would involve things like reflexes, strength testing, sensation testing, cranial nerve testing, which are some of the higher function, higher level and higher functioning nerves of the brain and the neck. Um, and what I mean by more sinister pathologies are things like fractures, things like brain bleeds, um, any other conditions that may be present. Those are the things that are red flags that need to be dealt with first. Your concussion is important. Your post-concussion syndrome is important, but those are life-threatening and they need to be ruled out first if they haven't already been done so. Um, so then in, I'm going to talk a little bit more about chronic patients because this is typically where we would use um, aerobic exercise testing. 
And the reason being is, again, if we think back to week one, one of the theories of post-concussion syndrome is, cerebral, is of a cerebrovascular origin or basically a brain blood flow origin, okay? Um, there may be a reduction or a dysfunctional uh, brain blood flow as far as post-concussive syndrome patients. And so uh, this is why we would typically utilize this greater aerobic testing in post-concussive syndrome patients. I'm not going to say that's always 100% of the time, but typically. Uh, the specific test that we use and that majority of people use is called the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test. And every time I say that we're going to do that to a patient, they always, you know, their eyes go wide, they get scared because they think I'm going to have them strapped to a treadmill and running at 100 miles per hour, but it's actually a little bit different. And I'll explain the specifics of it in a second. This was developed by uh, John Letty and associates down at the University of Buffalo and is a very widely used or should be widely used uh, assessment test here. So, um, Again, typically in the PCS patient, two to four weeks post-injury and beyond, of course, if somebody's been suffering for longer than that. The Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test is a test where we have the patient strapped to a heart rate monitor, and we are monitoring that throughout the duration of the protocol. Um, they will hop onto the treadmill and it's a walking test. So the, the speed stays constant at between 3.3 to 3.6 miles per hour. So it's, which is average walking pace for most people. It's not too fast. Where we do start to increase the variables is by increasing the incline. And so it's a stress test, essentially. We're seeing how far the body can be pushed before they're completely, um, actually there's a couple different markers, but where before they experience symptom exacerbation to a certain degree. And so it gets harder as we raise the incline and we monitor the heart rate as well. There are certain markers that we also assess for, um, but typically it's the heart rate that we're most interested in. Um, and so it, it gradually increasingly stresses the body and we can make assumptions based off the, the body's response. There is an alternative because I've had people always ask me, what if I can't get on a treadmill because I'm, I'm too uh, unsteady? Uh, there is a Buffalo concussion bite test, which can be uh, utilized as well. And in the event that that doesn't work either, there are other types of, let's say, lower grade or lower impact uh, aerobic testing that we can utilize as well. Okay, so before we get back to that slide, I'm, I'm just going to tell you for the Buffalo concussion treadmill test specifically, it helps us in two ways. So first way is this, it's a pass fail test. Okay. If the person passes, fantastic. That's great news. Okay. And that information can help us in a couple of different ways. It can tell us that maybe the origin of your PCS is not actually of a cerebral vascular component. It's not from a blood flow component. And that's great. Cause then we can rule that out and we can say that isn't actually a portion of your PCS. And maybe it's from one of the other origins, visual or vestibular or psychoemotional. And then we can continue testing that way. We can also utilize the Buffalo concussion treadmill test as a return to sport protocol. So, you know, we say with hockey players, you're not able to get back on the ice practicing with your team until you are able to pass this and you are healthy enough that you have passed the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. Okay. So that's basically the first bucket for patients that have passed. Second bucket is patients that have failed. And um, failing is okay here because it actually gives us information as well. So for example, um, the heart rate, let's say the heart rate that the patient has failed at is 130. And we know at 130 beats per minute that this patient has experienced symptom exacerbation to a certain degree that we have spoken about previously or prior to the test. If 130 is your symptom threshold, based on the concussion in sport group guidelines and the recommendations that they made, they offered the idea of uh, symptom or sub threshold uh, exercise. So we now know that your threshold is 130 beats per minute. So what I'm going to recommend is that you do your rehab protocol at less than 130 beats per minute because we know that will be enough to stress the body without causing a huge flare up of symptoms that have you laid up in bed for a few days, right? 
So pass or fail, this does really give us some good information uh, as far as how we utilize it in the treatment protocol. So this is, I'm gonna speak a little bit more about treatment here, utilizing exercise and treatment. And that same John Letty from the University of Buffalo and, and group, they published a large scale article in Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine, so a very well respected journal in 2018, about early subthreshold aerobic exercise being prescribed within one week of a sports related concussion can quicken recovery. So I, br I bring this up because, and still to this day, to this week, I had somebody come in and tell me this is that they they suffered a, a head injury. They went to the ER. They were diagnosed with a concussion by the ER physician, and they were sent home and told to not do anything for two weeks. Um, and so the patient heeded the advice, and they ended up feeling way worse after two weeks. And now it's a little bit of a longer road to recovery. We can see from this study here that aerobic exercise prescribed within one week can quicken recovery. And I will tell you this. This is from 2018. This is actually outdated now. There is actually new research that states that um, exercise within the first 48 to 72 hours of a sports related concussion can actually quicken recovery and is advised. And so the idea of, you know, limiting everything for two weeks should be thrown out the window. That is useless information and is still something that we see to this very day. Okay. Um, as far as, again, uh, using exercise as treatment in the PCS patient, so it norm normalizes cerebrovascular physiological dysfunction. Basically, it, it helps to normalize our blood flow, the blood flow component of a uh, PCS, if that is there. It also, again, here's some of the terms that we used from the nutrition presentation. Benefits, it improves BDNF, or brain-derived neurotropic factor. It improves IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which both have neural protective and neural regenerative effects. It improves neuroplasticity, which is a big buzzword right now, but basically it improves our brain's ability to learn and adapt, which is fantastic for rehab purposes. And to a lesser extent, these less two, but still to an extent, proliferation of neuronal stem cells, which help stem cells are pluripotent are able to differentiate into any sort of tissue. And so it helps to um, cause proliferation of those stem cells. And it also decreases neural de degeneration. And okay? so it basically has neural protective effects. That's amazing, right? Fantastic. This is all we want with a concussion, post-concussion syndrome. I know we're, I knew it. I, I speak, I, typically talk too long with this presentation. So I'll just quickly go over this again, same John Letty earlier study, but basically he did a study, uh, a, a longitudinal study where they tracked patients and they, they had one group um, who was cocooned or basically protected. Like I had spoken about the two weeks off. They had a second group where post injury, they post concussion injury, they started doing exercise. And they had a third group where it was a trained group of athletes who had a concussion, so they had, were exercising prior, they had the injury, and then they also were exercising post-injury as, as part of the rehab. So the results, for the first group, the cocoon group, they did not actually fully recover. And I'm, I'm obviously leaving out a, a number of details here, but they did not fully recover. The second group, the post-injury exercise group, they did recover and they actually noticed improvements in, in motor or movement function and cognition. The third group actually recovered and they thrived in, in their measures of motor function and cognition. This is essentially just highlighting that the sedentary versus the trained brain is very different in recovery. Okay. So even in the absence of any sort of concussion or post-concussion injury, um, being active is awesome. Being active is, is super beneficial. So like I said, from a treatment perspective, the treatment is based on the assessment. So um, we can construct a individualized progressive sub-threshold th sub aerobic exercise program for the patient, utilizing our findings from the brain, the Buffalo concussion test, okay? And so typically this is what the exercise pres prescription will look like. Um, either cycling or treadmilling, 
and ideally it's monitored, but it doesn't have, it doesn't need to be, um, minimum of 20 minutes a day. I typically will prescribe 20 to 30 minutes and the dose. So 80% of that threshold heart rate is where I will recommend people that that's not a hard and fast rule. That's just a very general statement. So it's not enough to cause exacerbation of symptoms. Um, it is sub threshold and uh, it, we can reap all the benefits of aerobic exercise without causing us to feel totally terrible. Typically one time a day and six to seven days a week. Exercise is stopped if there's extreme symptom exacerbation, like I said, and then we can utilize the Buffalo concussion treadmill test every few weeks to reestablish a threshold and then change the prescription because ideally, um, sorry, ideally when we retest that improves, right? Our, our threshold heart rate improves. So maybe you're at 130 one week, three weeks later, we retest you and you're at 150 which then changes our exercise prescription as well, and so on and so on until resolution is experienced. So that's how we can use aerobic exercise to our benefit and how we can use it as an assessment protocol. I'm just gonna quickly go through the cervical spine as well, or the neck, because uh, as I stated in week one, the cervical spine is typically a significant component of um, concussion and post-concussion rehab. In about 90 to 95% of concussion injuries, there's always an element of whiplash. And so the neck can be a source of ongoing dysfunction and needs to be assessed and addressed as well. Um, so from a rehabilitation perspective, we want to work on range of motion, improving our range of motion so that we can get as close to what is quote unquote normal range or what is our normal range, because that will help to um, decrease muscular tension, improve movements, help to uh, nourish the joints and help to decrease pain. And then we use a progressive prescribed exercise platform. So progressive meaning it should, should never become easy. It should constantly be challenging our body in order for our body to adapt and it's prescribed. So it's specific to you. If you go to somewhere and they give you the same generic exercise sheet that they've given to the past 30 other patients, that is not prescribed. That is not tailor-made. It needs to be specific to you. Okay. Is there similarities between you and another person's exercise prescription? Likely, right? But at the same time, it needs to be tailored to the person. The number of sets, the number of repetitions, the weights, the tension of the therabands, all that needs to be specific. Um, both range of motion and prescribed exercise help to uh, promote inflammation reduction or decrease inflammation, helps to improve muscular strength and endurance, helps to improve stability of an area, and it helps to just generally increase the capacity of the structures. Okay? If we increase the strength and the endurance of, and the stability of an area, the structures are able to better withstand stress and load, and therefore it should help in a preventative and a recovery uh, effect. So there's a rehab protocol here, I, a very generalized one after I just finished saying that nobody should be, should be uh, doing the same prescribed exercises. These are just examples of a couple exercises that I will typically give. Um, normally in, in non-COVID settings when we're in person, I would demonstrate these. Um, but again, what you should be doing, same as the nutritional, uh, same as the nutritional interventions that I spoke about, you need to speak to a licensed healthcare professional so that they can adequately assess you and prescribe you with the, the recommendations that you need to be doing. Okay, so I know I just spoke a mile a minute and I apologize for that. It's, it's typically I, I divide those two lectures into two different uh, Two, two different lectures, I guess, but uh, I wanted to really jam pack all that in so that you can uh, get some good information. You can always refer back to it uh, on the webinar, or you can always um, uh, reference the notes, which I believe are being made available as well. So I will stop my screen here and it looks like we have some questions. We do. Um, one of our members um, is actually, oops, it just, my screen changed. Um, one of the members um, is actually agreeing and they said exercises and physical activity is essential for recovery from ABI. Doctors, specialists prescribed and recommended it. 
So for her and her experience, she was lucky enough to have that same um, recommendation. Um, accessing funding for it has continued to be a, a battle or struggle. Yes, yes. And uh, I totally agree. Um, and it's unfortunate, of course, uh, that that is an issue. That is, I mean, I think that's a larger scale issue than what we have time for right now. But that being said, is that um, doctors, specialists have prescribed and recommended it. So that's fantastic. They should be providing you with a home program, right? Because even the patients that I see, maybe I see them, you know, at the very most, I would think twice a week, right? More commonly once a week. And then my goal is never to have somebody come see me forever. It's to wean them off of care. That being said, say they're coming in twice a week. That's, you know, an hour and a half of time out of their seven days. So they need to be doing a lot of stuff outside of here. And that's typically what I do is I, I either send people home with, with exercises or I email them in follow up um, because I let them know this is a 50 50 relationship. I'm going to do what I can in here and in, in my office with you, but I need you to buy in at home. Um, and so what I typically see is, you know, maybe a patient's not improving as much as I would expect. And they come in and I ask them, Hey, have you been doing exercise? And they say, well, no. And so I tell them, look, that's pretty self-explanatory then, right? You, you bought into this 50, 50 with me at the start of this. And I said, we'll get you better, but you got to do your part too. Right. That's just a long winded way of saying that, um, you should, the, I guess the, uh, the specialists, the doctors, the healthcare professionals should be providing you with a home exercise plan that you can be doing at home as well. And I, I get it. I know that the funding is a battle and, and that's something that we do see. Um, but yeah, I guess that's the reality and kind of the confines that we have to work with right now. So another member is asking a question. Um, so to have a concussion, is it necessary to hit your head against something? Or is it also a, a concussion if your head moves violently in a whiplash or hitting your head on something? So essentially, do you have to have impact or can it just simply be that brain to skull impact? Yeah, and that's a very good question and something that we did cover in, in week one. So I encourage you to go back and, and review the webinar if you can. Um, without getting into too much of the nitty gritty, no, you don't have to be hit just in the head. There can be a uh, concussive type injury um, if there is enough force transmitted through the body that it causes certain things to happen within the head as well. Um, we often see... Again, I bring up sport as an example most of the time because it's very obvious, right? Uh, and so we see this in, say, like a rugby or a football tackle. Somebody gets hit in the, the midsection and they end up whipping their head back and forth enough to actually cause that type of injury. Um, or same thing in, in kind of regular everyday, you know, somebody's walking down the sidewalk, they slip on ice and maybe they don't actually impact their head, but it's enough of a jarring movement that can cause kind of that whipping motion of the head and the neck. And so, yes, you are correct that it can happen without hitting your head. And that's also one of the big reasons why we have to assess the cervical spine or the neck um, because of the whiplash component of uh, those injuries. Thank you. Actually, I'm just curious um, in relation to one of the other members' questions, um, in your practice, I know you can't speak for everyone, but in your practice, do you typically um, kind of send people home with a recommendation to go off and find exercise, but also here are some exercises if you can't access or here are some accessible ways to, to find out. Yeah. Yeah. So typically when I send somebody home with exercise um, or recommendations, as far as movement, it's not something, it's something that can be done anywhere. It can be done on their bed at home. It can be done in a hotel room and when they're out of town, it can be done sitting in their car at a red light. And the reason I do it that way is because yes, funding is an issue. I don't want you to have to you know, go out and buy all these heavy weights or have specialized machinery or anything like that. But the other thing is um, making things as easy as possible for people encourages adherence. And I get it. I mean, I've fallen off exercise plans, just like every other human in the world, right? And, and so I think if we can make things as easy as possible while still having effectiveness, 
people will do it more often and they will realize better outcomes. And then it's just a positive feedback loop, right? I'm doing these exercises. I feel way better doing this. Give me more, give me more. And that's awesome. I love when patients do that. I love the patient where I actually have to kind of pull back the reins and say, whoa, you're doing too much as opposed to the patient that I have to kick in the butt because they're, they're easier to deal with and they're, they're actually going to do the things I recommend to get better. Um, instead of, you know, me constantly trying to have to, um, convince somebody to do exercise. So yeah, as far as sending people home with stuff, I, I typically, I usually do that every, every other session, if not every session. Thank you. Cause I know that some people are going to be thinking that, especially if they're watching it later on, um, just out of curiosity, well, then where, where do I get it? If I, if I don't have the funding, because, you know, it's, as you say, even it's, it's a real limitation, um, yeah. you know, and right now, especially with the you know, plethora of online things that are available, it's, I was just curious, is there something, some other way of accessing? Yeah. And I mean, I think I alluded to this earlier too, is, you know, something as simple as walking, you can yeah. walk anywhere, right? Uh, walk outside, even, you know, I, I get the excuse, oh, it's snowy and icy. That's fine. Then go like walk around your house. Well, if you can handle it, walk around a mall, right? Like, like there's, there's so many ways to adapt. And this is why I was saying at the beginning is that I, I love act physical activity because it's one of these things where I feel like I have an answer for every question or every hurdle that somebody brings up, right? Because it, it's just so adaptable. There's so many ways and so many variables to, to, to change, I'll say. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when you have a recommendation from a doctor, um, your, your mind almost goes to, you know, the bigger things. And so those big gyms and, you know, the, um, you know, the PT and the OT, like those larger things. And we, I think all of us, we forget about those, you know, more accessible ways mm -hmm. of, of exercising. All you got to do is move. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then just because I have a feeling this will cross somebody's mind as well. I know that, and it may be a redundant question on the way I'm about to say it, but hopefully I say it how I'm thinking a couple people will want me to ask it. Um, so you were uh, talking about um, exercise relieving compressive symptoms. Um, so would that also help with um, some of those like adrenal fatigue or neuro fatigue um, symptoms as well? Because I know that that can be kind of a barrier in itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great point actually. And, and so uh, that is also a, a hurdle that we have to overcome is that people often say, I'm just way too exhausted to do this. Right. And I understand that. And, and that is a very real thing. Um, and this is where things need to be tailor-made, right? Um, the MS patient versus the acute concussion patient versus the chronic pain patient of 15 years will, will respond and has, will respond very differently and has different demands than one another. And so, um, can you do five minutes of walking? Can you do two minutes of walking? Whatever it is, start, right. And you, you have to start somewhere and you will build, right. You will build. And that's your body is very adaptive. Okay. It's very plastic neuroplastic, those are all the, the big buzzwords right now. And they're buzzwords for a reason is because your body will adapt. And it's hard, it's hard work. And that's kind of what I was alluding to at the beginning is that people, a lot of people don't like to do it because it is work. Sometimes it doesn't feel great. Okay, I'll, I'll be very honest, rehab is not is not, it's not typically exercise that you end up feeling fantastic afterwards. Mm. You may, but typically not. Um, but at the same time, if you stick to it, if you get through day one, if you get through day two, day three, and you keep progressing, <coughs> excuse me, by day 90, you'll, you'll look back and say, wow, look at where I've come. Right. And it's one of those things you really, you, you got to kind of have tunnel vision and just stick to the plan, have the overarching goal at the end, and you just keep pushing through and, and you'll get there. Well, thank you for that. No problem. Any questions, comments um, for Dr. Gargum? And uh, I'll give it about one minute. Um, and if you don't, that's okay. Um, I will end our meeting early this evening. But so.
And I, I just want to say um, thank you again for having myself and our whole team. We, uh, I think I said this at the beginning, I always love this talk because um, uh, it's something that I'm passionate about that the rest of our team is very passionate about. Um, and I hope you were able to get some, some information. Maybe it's not uh, like applic applicable information, but it's, it's knowledge to have to broaden your knowledge base and gives you a better understanding of your condition or a friend's condition, a loved one's condition. Um, so yes, thank you very much for having us. You're, I hadn't even thought of that. Um, you know, but you know, understanding other people as well, you know, and, and their own experience. I hadn't even thought of that. So thank you. And <laughs> you know, to be honest, it's always really lovely to have you as well. I mean, I I find these sessions incredibly informative. Um, you know, and and I know that a lot of our, our members do as well. Um fantastic. And, yeah, thank you. No, no problem at all. I love I love being here. So <laughs> One of our members has said, um, hi, thank you for the presentation. And there was a lot of useful information. Another member says, great information, thank you. Another member says, I like the elbow bending exercise. Um, so again, that, you know, that really easily accessible um, mm -hmm. body movement. Um, and thank you to you and your team. Um, that's some excellent information that you've brought. Fantastic. I'm glad you all enjoyed. Yes, thank you. So I just want to um, quickly thank, I know he's not here at the moment, but I just want to quickly thank once again, uh, Mr. Brandon Peterson from the Clayshore Orlando on behalf of PIA Law. Um, <laughs> yes, and thank you again, Dr. Sean Gargoom for coming out. And again, such an incredible presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you bring so much to, to our community. Thank you to all of our members for coming out. Um, I hope that you found this incredibly informative and we will see you on Wednesday for our community meeting.